The reference book On the Front Lines breaks down 11 of the most important battles in galactic history, pulling from all nine current movies and the Clone Wars series. Like I often do with the novels, I read through the book and pulled out a number of facts I found to be interesting, so let's get to it. General Tobler Seal was the Gungan commander of the Battle of Naboo. Some Gungans thought Jar Jar was gifted by the gods thanks to his lucky kills. In reality, Captain Tarples kept Jar Jar safe and racked up 16 battle droid kills of his own. Poggle the Lesser was the military commander for the Separatists during the Battle of Geonosis, not Count Dooku. Since the battle droids were made in his factories, he understood their capabilities better. 200 Jedi traveled to Geonosis to rescue Obi-Wan, Anakin, and Padme. The Separatists never expected or even tried to win the First Battle of Geonosis. Their goal was only to delay the Republic long enough for their battle droids and the schematics for the Death Star to make it off-world. Republic engineers could not figure out how to reconfigure Geonosian factories to fit Republic needs, so they devoted few resources to the planet's occupation, and it was taken again by the Separatists in less than a year. CT-411, who would eventually be known as Commander Pons, was never meant to be a commander. He was trained in reconnaissance, but Mace Windu requested an update from him on the battlefield and kept him close. So this should be Pons in the film. General Warm Loathsome of the Battle of Christophsis earned his rank due to his service in the planetary defense forces of Kirkoidia. Some of his droid army formerly served a small corporate entity known as the Retail Caucus. The Battle of Christophsis was one of the earliest examples of the effectiveness of Jedi-led clones. The Battle of Geonosis was considered to be clumsy and inefficient. After losing Christophsis, the Separatists began work on what they considered to be Jedi-proof weapons, such as the Defoliator and the Blue Shadow Virus. At Christophsis, B-1 battle droids outnumbered B-2 super battle droids on the battlefield by a factor of 100 to 1. I assume that figure is fairly consistent throughout the rest of the Clone Wars. Ahsoka's assignment to Anakin Skywalker was rare. Jedi Knights were supposed to choose their Padawans, but the Council began bending the rules after the Clone Wars began. Octoptara Tridroids were nicknamed Virus Droids not only because they looked somewhat germ-like, but were also known to occasionally carry biological plagues. When it came to the Battle of Ryloth, neither the Republic nor the Separatists valued the world for its people, but rather for its strategic position in the galaxy. The Twi'lek people resented both sides of the conflict for that fact. AT-RTs could reach 90 kilometers an hour. The book notes that Blurgs could be found on many worlds. They were originally created for the Ewok made-for-TV movies and legends. At the time of the Battle of Coruscant, the Separatists had mostly been pushed into the fringes of the galaxy by the Outer Rim sieges. The Republic had pursued, leaving their capital lightly defended by a home defense fleet that had seen little action. The Coruscant home fleet was led by Commander Honor Salima. While Obi-Wan and Anakin rescued Palpatine, the Republic used small groups of vacuum-suited, rocket-powered clone troopers to jet through space to board damaged Separatist ships to take control of their bridges. That's just awesome. A third of the Separatist fleet that took part in the Battle of Coruscant were either destroyed or captured. The Battle of Coruscant helped fuel the fire of fear in the citizens of the Republic capital that danger could be close by. This aided in the public's support of the termination of the Jedi Order. The book confirms that the Battle of Scarif represented the entirety of the Rebel fleet. A single reactor blast from the Death Star kills every living being for hundreds of kilometers. At least one Hammerhead Corvette, the Consonance, is confirmed to have survived the Battle of Scarif. The fallen soldiers of Scarif are said to have had things named after them. That could be further evidence that Admiral Raddus did not survive since we have the Resistance ship, the Raddus, appearing in The Last Jedi. Tarkin's desire to obliterate the Rebellion was the cause of the Death Star's loss at the Battle of Yavin. Had he simply destroyed Alderaan and let that sink into the galaxy, support for the Rebellion would have faded from fear but he sought out the rebel base for a prideful show of force and lost the weapon in the process. Having lost most of their fleet in the Battle of Scarif, the rebels did not have enough transports to completely evacuate the Yavin base, but we do know that Mon Mothma was off-planet. The long run down the Death Star's trench was required to give the computer enough time to calculate. 
It simply appears as a countdown in the film, but I always wondered if there was a reason they started so far away from the exhaust port. The loss at Yavin was blamed on Tarkin's hubris. He had complete faith in the Death Star. He assumed it did not require a naval escort. He refused to launch TIE fighters in its defense. Vader had done so on his own authority, and even then he only launched one squadron. The Empire learned to never again face the Alliance without exploiting their numerical superiority. Wedge Antilles felt intense survivor's guilt about having to pull out of the Death Star's trench. The Imperial blockade at the Battle of Hoth was only meant to keep rebels from their jump point, not surround the planet. Interdictors would have been useful, but there's no mention of them. My thinking right now is that they were not part of Death Squadron, and Vader was so desperate to catch Skywalker, he refused to wait for reinforcements. The book mentions the deleted scene of snowtroopers opening the door to the trapped Wampas, so that really happened. Rogue Squadron is noted as an X-Wing Ace Squadron. This seems obvious, but most of what we think we know about Rogue Squadron is from Legends, so it's nice to have their elite distinction made canon again. A soldier recounts their story as a member of Twilight Company. They note not being able to reach their commander on comms, which makes sense because the book Battlefront Twilight Company tells us he died during the fight. Hobby Clivian is also confirmed to have died in the Battle of Hoth. After his snowspeeder was crippled, he flew it into the head of the lead at, -AT decapitating it. That's another deleted scene from the movie, and the Legends novelization also includes the scene, which recounts the death of General Veers. There's no mention of his death or survival in the book. I would guess his survival is unlikely, but hey, in Legends, he was retconned to have lived, so who knows? In the Battle of Endor, Nine Nubs says he would have kept the radar dish of the Millennium Falcon intact if he had been flying in the Death Star. As a Solisten, he was used to navigating caverns. Nine claims Wedge was a former smuggler. In Legends, Wedge was unwilling to smuggle, although he was friendly with famous smuggler Booster Tarek and his daughter. I wonder if Wedge is getting a new backstory for canon. Nine also references his ship, the Melcrawler, and says it's faster than the Falcon. The Melcrawler appears in the story Moving Target, where it's destroyed. The Melcrawler 2 appears in the comic Shattered Empire. Kez Dameron acted as bait to lure ATSTs into log traps. He won the respect of Nisa the Ewok, and they shared a bottle of Sunbury wine at the celebration that night. The Battle of Jakku is covered, but I didn't really learn much there, and the final battle talked about in the book is the Battle of Starkiller Base. If the superweapon hadn't been charged up, damaging the thermal oscillator would have only brought it offline, not destroyed the weapon completely. The First Order walkers seen in the film are named as ATPDs, or All-Terrain Patrol Droids. They were armed with two heavy laser cannons and protected sensitive installations on Starkiller Base. And those are all the facts I pulled out of On the Front Lines. This was a pretty cool book. It didn't offer a ton in the way of new information, but it's interesting and reads like a history book. There's also a lot of cool artwork and tactical analysis that I think I'll revisit at some point. It's a fine coffee table book, but I wouldn't say it's as essential as the visual guides that accompany every movie. But that's it for today. If you haven't already, please like this video, subscribe to the channel, follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and consider checking out my Patreon page. As always, thanks for watching, and may the Force be with you.